kneel before Zor. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war Hang on! Welcome to a very special Vintage Video Patreon pick, where our patrons at the $100 tier are invited to request any pre-80s title they'd like for a custom review from the Vintage Video team. Overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't, I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today, Louis Letizia has asked us to review The Other Side of Midnight, released June 8th, 1977. It was written by Herman Rauscher and Daniel Teradash, adapted from the novel by Sidney Sheldon, with uncredited work from Barry Sandler, directed by Charles Jarrett, and released by 20th Century Fox. The central idea of this story, a man plotting to kill his wife, came from an unproduced screenplay that author Sidney Sheldon had pitched to RKO, called Orchids for Virginia, but when the rights reverted back to Sheldon, he recycled the plot into his 1973 novel, The Other Side of Midnight which, upon its publication, quickly reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Paramount president Frank Blanz was quick to secure the movie rights, and after he parted with the studio, he bought the rights back, intending to produce himself. Ronald Neem was the first attached director, but a very complicated international production schedule ruled him out, and Charles Jarrett was brought in. A total of 136 sets were constructed across the domestic and international shooting locations, including an entire Greek seacoast village built for the film and taking up two full sound stages. Why? Why would you? Because it was a romantic epic and you have to spend money on them. So you got to look for ways to spend money. Pretty sure that Greek villages exist. That's true. But they're on the wrong side. They're all inland. (laughs) For the part of Larry Douglas, Yablans was set on unknown actors, but he and Jarrett were looking for an Errol Flynn type. Because of the book's success, a big return was expected, and 20th Century Fox dedicated the bulk of their marketing budget, pushing Other Side of Midnight to audiences, and neglecting an original space opera with a precariously ballooning budget called Star Wars. Fox was so confident that Star Wars would flop that they forced theaters to book screenings of Star Wars if they wanted to run The Other Side of Midnight. (laughs) Which is actually a violation of the 1951 ban on block booking, and 20th Century Fox became the first studio prosecuted for violating the ban. They pled no contest, agreeing to a completely meaningless fine of (laughs) $25,000. As you should have guessed by now, the film was a relative flop compared to Star Wars, bringing in $24 million in its full release compared to a record $221 million take for Star Wars. The film is supposedly Andy Warhol's favorite. Oh. The Other Side of Midnight, Andy Warhol's favorite film. I like that he doesn't count any of his own films, I guess. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like my Which one is he going to pick of his own that's his favorite, though? <laughs> I like that one of the Empire State Building for like eight hours. <laughs> The film was remade in India as 1980's O Bawafa. In 1990, Sheldon wrote a sequel entitled Memories of Midnight, which was adapted into a miniseries starring Jane Seymour and Omar Sharif, but we'll discuss that at the end of the film. I don't understand how you make a sequel to this one. Oh, it's so good. (laughs) We open in Greece in 1947. The camera floats high above the remains of the Parthenon to reveal a yacht blasting through the Mediterranean. The yacht continues to a small castle on the water, and it reminds me of Oliver Reed's impregnable fortress from Condor Man from the same director. Yeah. The yacht floats up to a dock, and a man steps out and walks through a jail to visit with a prisoner. This man is Constantine Demiris, played by Raph Vallone, and Marie-France Pizier, as Noelle Page, is summoned from her cell to speak with him. He has one important question. Did she kill Kathy? And eventually she responds directly to it. Innocent or guilty? Innocent, we cut back eight years to Marseille, where Noelle's father is screaming her name from a street under her window. She finishes dressing, and her father escorts her to a job interview. It seems she's given the job without much discussion, and she'll be living on site, even though the building seemed a short walk from home. She's coordinating the shipment of clothing from overseas, and one night her employer congratulates her for a job well done with her choice of any dress from the latest shipment. She knows just the one, but once she has it in hand, 
It seems her boss requires one last favor in exchange for the dress, and he slips his hand under her skirt. She screams at him and throws the dress in his face before running home. Back with her parents, she learns that this was always part of the deal her father made with the man. Ordinarily, you would expect, as in Tess last season, that the parents were on the verge of destitution or something, but Dad admits that he blew the cash reward on a bunch of trivial trinkets. <laughs> he just starts listing off what his daughter is worth to him. I received a small amount of money. It afforded me that radio, a new jacket, a cycle, some wine, a few things to comfort me and your mother against whatever comes. It's like if I told my kid, we all win in this scenario. I got an Xbox, some sunglasses, a crunch wrap. <laughs> That's not even going to last today, Dad. It's gone already. <laughs> Wait, here it comes. Oh, it's back. <laughs> Jesus. Mom doesn't say anything because I think she knows her husband is trash. Noelle's father advises her to stick with the deal because in the coming war, this man's money will protect her from the tragedy that will befall most of the country. Her father specifically says that basically all she has is beauty. Right. And so I feel like this is her first lesson in life, that that's how she has to succeed. Right. You have beauty. It's your only weapon of survival. She returns to her employer, and on the way we hear church bells chiming, but unfortunately the scene cuts exactly between the 11th and a possible 12th chime, which means that the rest of this film is happening on the other side of midnight. <laughs> Did you count the chimes? I did count the chimes. There was 11 and then it cut. The man looks surprised to see her come back and we cut right to him having sex on her for probably her first time. She packs a suitcase and sneaks out and we cut to Washington, D.C., also 1939, and we start Catherine's story. We see Kathy, played by Susan Sarandon, riding in a taxi to another job interview as secretary for the Fraser & Associates PR firm. She admits to the driver that she is vastly unqualified and might not even be able to afford this ride to the job. At the front desk, she tries to check in for her interview when she overhears a speakerphone call between the current secretary and Mr. Fraser himself, played by Clue Gulliger. He needs the March issue of Life magazine, and she warns him that she'll have to order a back issue from the publisher. Instead of checking in, Kathy disappears back into the building lobby. Fraser is meeting with Constantine Damaris. Damaris is a Greek shipping tycoon, and he's offering his entire fleet free of charge to the upcoming war effort. The secretary, Susie, ducks back in with the magazine Fraser asked for, and he's able to hand it off to Damaris as intended before he leaves. When Fraser asks how she got it so fast, she says a woman here to interview just happened to have it on her, and he asks for that woman to be sent in. Just happen to have that copy of Life with you. Yes, sir. It's six months old. I'm a slow reader. How'd you do it? The barbershop in the lobby. My father once told me the barbershops are where all old magazines go to die. <sighs> he admits to her that he's looking to hire an assistant and asks if she's always so resourceful. She seems well-researched in their entire client listing. Got two deposed kings, two South American countries, small, but IBM, three senators, Constantine Demiris. Oh, that's who that What? And special projects for the government now and then. I did some homework. Yes, you did. He hires her on the spot. Fraser's secretary, Susie, offers to rent Kathy her second bedroom since her roommate just got married and they'll be working for the same man now. We cut to Paris and find Noelle walking out of the train station in the same dress she seemed to quit that fabric job wearing. She asks a taxi driver for a cheap hotel recommendation. Do you guys recall the last time we saw people in Europe asking for directions to a cheap motel? Uh, the Great Muppet Caper? That's right. <laughs> I can only take you as far as the lobby. Places to park your carcass. She tells the driver about her previous work, and he offers to take her to one of the bigger local fashion houses where he heard from his sister there may be an opening. Noelle is grateful for the tip. She tries to bring her suitcase inside with her, but the driver says that he'll wait here to take her to a hotel when she comes back. She's a few steps away from the cab when the man drives away with all her belongings. She realizes quickly she's been robbed and wanders into the nearby Hotel Regina. She tries to take a quick nap on a couch in the lobby, and her eyes are closed less than a second before a hotel employee is calling her out. The man grabs her roughly by the arm and tries to drag her out, threatening to call the police, when an American in uniform, Larry Douglas, played by John Beck, steps up and pretends they're here together and he just got held up. 
After the hotel man leaves, Larry advises her to find another hotel to work or to remember to pay off the staff for permission to work in the lobby. She explains she's not a prostitute, she's just broke. She's so embarrassed that she turns to leave and he follows her to invite her to dinner at Shea Victor across the street. I don't know if embarrassed is the word, I think more insulted. Maybe. Over dinner, she tells her story and he explains that he's an American who signed up to fight with the RAF to help with the war effort, predicting America's eventual involvement. They're visited by Larry's friend Steve Whitney and his date. And this is Bridget, um, French person. Steve needs some cash, and even though Larry claimed to be broke also, he slips his friend some. So you lied to me. You have money. Oh, I always lie. Uh, the truth makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> he offers her a place to stay, and we quickly cut to him giving her the tour. This is a chair. Another chair. Here we have the window. <laughs> this is the floor, uh... This is the ceiling, the walls, the doors. This is a rug. Uh, another window. And this is the boy. And that's the girl. How would it all end? He offers her the bed to herself, but we cut to them making love. We get a long montage of them exploring the sights of Paris together. The Eiffel Tower, bocce ball courts, they sit for a street artist, and as the man works, Larry does his own terrible drawing of Noel. Later, we see both drawings hung on the wall together. I, I thought it was odd that it was like, oh, like we were going to do it like a a, a a Paris montage. But it was like, bocce ball? Is, yeah. that, is that a pretty common Paris Oh, yeah, it's all over game? France. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Well, but also like when he like hurls that ball and just <laughs> knocks the other yeah. one like into orbit. It's, it's like, like this isn't a strength contest. Yeah, it's like, dude rude but everyone applauds it maybe (laughs) (laughs) maybe clapping in french is a sign of disapproval (laughs) we learn in conversation that they are spending their last day together before he ships out he takes her to the fanciest place in town they overhear constantine damaris's shrewd negotiation tactics at the next table over and noel asks who the man is as he packs his bags the next morning he promises to return in three weeks november 15th at 7 p.m he says the rent is paid for for the next six months and she's convinced he will never come back and doesn't want to let him go. He tells her to put her nervous energy to good use and buy a wedding dress for when he gets back. She smiles wide, and he slips out the door and down to his waiting taxi. The next day, Noel goes and finds work modeling for a local dressmaker. We cut back to D.C., where Kathy seems to be making simple mistakes all over her job, including, I think he said, hanging up on the President of the United States? Yeah. While still accomplishing amazing tasks. You screw up the most fundamental assignments, Kathy, yet you pull off the most impossible. Well, I... I, What the hell is... Maybe I'm working too hard. He decides a job change is in order and transfers her from existing accounts to prospective accounts. I couldn't tell if that was good or bad, so I was relieved when the characters weren't sure either. (laughs) Is that a promotion or a demotion? I have no idea. Well, do I get a raise? No, but you know I get fired. I get out of here. That night, they end up working past midnight, or in other words, to the other side of midnight, (laughs) and they suddenly find themselves close enough for a kiss, but instead, Frazier suggests a raise, and she seems disappointed. We cut to Shea Victor on the evening of Noel and Larry's planned reunion, and he's a no-show. She realizes later that they're closing up for the night, and leaves a number for Larry to reach her at in case he shows up after hours. And pays for her 16 orders of bread. Yeah, and what are we going to do with this phone number when we close? Just, like, put it in the window? Like, call Noel. She tells her boss, the fashion designer, that he must have died, and the woman tries to talk her off the ledge as she goes ballistic. She promises Noel that Larry will return. Over time, we see her keeping eye on Shea Victor, hanging up the wedding dress she bought, and trying to write letters to Larry however possible. One afternoon, Noelle models a dress for a couple, and the man follows her back into the dressing room to offer his business card. He claims to work as a casting agent for a big-shot film company. She stashes the card away, and moments after he leaves, she collapses to the floor. I I had some, like, uh, fame PTSD from this. Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, man. This guy's a liar, and he's going to make a weird video about your feet. (laughs) (laughs) We learn that this fainting spell was a result of her pregnancy with Larry's baby, Her boss assures her that she'll develop a maternity line and she isn't automatically fired. That night, she thinks she spots Larry stepping into Shea Victor, but when she gets inside, she finds different uniformed pilots. She recognizes Larry's friend, though, Steve, and asks where Larry is. 
The man breaks it to her rather harshly that Larry is back in America training pilots to avoid a girl that he impregnated in England. Noelle is horrified to learn of Larry's womanizing ways and backs away from Steve before running out of the restaurant. Although Steve does everything in his power to be creepy and gross. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, why don't you hang out? We're, we're, we're going to go see a show or, yeah. or something. I also wasn't sure whether or not to believe him at this point. Yeah, that's true. Because he, he, he's that not That could be most... a nice way to say he died in a dogfight over I know. London. <laughs> that's, honestly, that's what I was thinking. I was just like, he's he seems to be delivering the news very strangely. Yeah. <laughs> Do they not have that expression here in Paris? He got an English woman pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> that means he died in a dogfight over yeah. London. It's like that killing the rabbit thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> That night, she starts a bath and climbs in and performs an abortion with a coat hanger. No more wire <laughs> oh, no. Later, we see Noelle in bed, and a doctor tells her boss that she nearly killed herself with the abortion. The woman reminds Noelle that she will always have a modeling job if she wants it, but she refuses. Later that day, Noelle calls the number of the casting agent and confesses her interest in film work. And I'm not sure what's happening here during this call. I think she's still collapsing from the shitty okay. abortion Internal that she gave herself. Internal bleeding. She's yeah. very injured. I think part of the point is that she's doing it later that day. Like, okay. she didn't wait till she recovered. She was like, I have no time to waste. I got to get this started right now. See, I, I thought that, because we only hear her side of the conversation. And she's like collapsing and on the verge of tears while she talks. Yeah, because I, I thought it was, oh, she doesn't that he's not hiring or not looking anymore. Oh, and that's okay. why she's got oh. like, uh, okay, well, no, I just cause she's like this. gripping her specifically her uteral region. We cut to a newsreel about world war two playing in a screening room at the offices of Fraser and associates. Fraser steps in and summons Kathy out with him. He tells Kathy that he's sending her to Hollywood to supervise an army recruitment film. He also announces that he's making her an associate and she throws her arms around him to kiss him in celebration. But again, is coldly rebuffed. We cut to Hollywood as Kathy arrives on set and is approached by the piece's director, O'Brien, played by Howard Hessman. He refers to her as a producer and gives her a tour of the set. She calls out problems as she sees them, like uniformed men on the set where people shouldn't be uniformed yet. The studio is shooting three different war films simultaneously, so a lot of these guys end up on the wrong set. Excuse me. I like how he gives her advice uh, in being a producer that she just fakes it because everyone else does. Yeah, that's accurate. He introduces Kathy to the crew, and she lectures the men in uniform about being in the wrong costumes. One of the men is Larry Douglas, and we are meant to realize before she does that he is not in costume at all, but his actual uniform. Yes, but you're not supposed to be in uniform until tomorrow, and then you're supposed to be enlisted men, not officers. But I like being an officer. <laughs> <laughs> right. You've been in the army for one day and they make you a captain in the air corps well don't you think i look good as a captain first lieutenant second lieutenant third lieutenant <laughs> look uh just go back to wardrobe and get rid of it and uh while you're at it get rid of those medals and the ribbons too well i thought these would give the film a little color we're not at war you would have had to have won them in a carnival well maybe i won them in the raf and then got transferred to the u.s air corps Later, Kathy is sitting by herself in the commissary when Larry comes to join her for lunch and shows that he ditched the medals and ribbons and wants to know if his costume is more convincing now. She thinks he should be ashamed for stealing valor and playing hero when there are men out there fighting right now and he's able-bodied enough to enlist himself. Well, you enjoy wearing a, a uniform on a film set and, and strutting around girls, but have you ever thought of enlisting? Oh, and get shot at someday, maybe? Oh, that's for suckers. This is much more fun. She tells him he's fired on the spot and they'll cut him a check for the time he's already served. That evening, she meets with Fraser at a fancy restaurant in town and Fraser introduces her to Captain Larry Douglas, who she'll be working with on this recruitment spot. Larry is kind enough not to reveal to Fraser that she has called him a faker several times. Uh, a lot of medals you have there, Captain. Well, these, uh, I won these at a carnival. Carnival? <laughs> I don't think so. Captain Douglas was with the RAF. He has six German aircraft to his credit. You built German aircrafts? <laughs> oh. No, he oh, you mean you shot them. shot them down. That makes him an ace. Oh. Is that how many it takes? Six? I, think, I think it takes five. Oh, five. So he's an ace. Fraser steps away to bother a senator who's been avoiding him, and Larry gives Kathy an opportunity to thank him for not throwing her under the bus. Dinner at a restaurant of your choice tonight. 
We get our second falling in love with Larry montage, <laughs> this time at DC landmarks like the Lincoln Monument and rowing in the Potomac. But this time we know better to know that this is romantic. Right. We see them slow dancing at a club and it seems like she's annoyed about being jabbed with his erection and asks us to sit down. <laughs> he tells her it's a compliment and that the world could explode any minute now, so why can't they just be together? Do you guys remember the last time we saw a man threaten a woman with a nuclear holocaust in search of sex? I do. What was that? Same time next year? That's right. I just remembered something. What? The Russians have the bomb. We could all be dead tomorrow. She tells him that behind his medals, she can see a woman left in his wake at every city he's ever been stationed. This one is uh, Debbie in Detroit and uh, Fifi in Paris, uh, Consuela in Madrid and uh, Lulu in London. And I guess I just don't want to be another moose head on your wall, okay? Do you guys recall the last time we saw a moose head on a wall? Oh. Uh, Arthur? Arthur. Oh, I got it. <laughs> <clears throat> What's the rest of this moose? <laughs> Larry tries to convince Kathy he loves her by grabbing a random passerby to testify as to his feelings for her. He loves you very much. Thank you, sir, and God bless you. When they get to the place Larry is renting from an uncle, he gives Kathy a familiar tour. And uh, over here we... Let me guess. The bedroom. The bedroom. <laughs> this, of course, is the bed, as you can see. Mm-hmm. And this is the boy, and there is the girl. How will it all turn out? We cut right to them having sex that night. And then we cut to Nazi-occupied France where Noel is redressing after sex with a big-time actor who got her decent parts in a couple of his own films, but she's leaving him now because his career has dead-ended. He blames the war for his lull, but she's impatient and says she will send for her things. As soon as she steps outside, her things are raining down on her as the actor, Philippe Sorel, tosses them down from a balcony, suggesting she cross the square to the Nazi party office and get a better job by screwing Hitler himself. Noel visits with a Swedish intelligence office looking for information on her fiancé, Larry Douglas, and is told that he's still serving in the war, but that sometime in the month which will live in infamy, he was married to a PR specialist named Catherine Alexander. Later, we see Noel wandering through a restaurant searching until she finds a man sitting alone under a window. She tells the man a sob story about her younger brother having joined the war effort, and he looks amused. It becomes clear that she's reading lines from a script he has written and starts testing her memory by asking for more lines from other parts of his unproduced screenplay. She read the script with her ex, Philippe, and knew that he wouldn't get the part, so she went right to the author to plead for it. He asks her name, and she seems worried he might adjust it. What's your name? Noel Page. Noel Page. No. I would like to not have it changed. There is someone I would have known about me when I become a star. <laughs> become a star. Noel, you do have style. Now, we must see if you also have talent. Oh. He touches his hand to her face and she nuzzles it seductively, and we cut right to the two of them fucking beside a fireplace. Just as he approaches Climax, she dumps a handful of ice into their laps, and for some reason he enjoys this. We cut right from this scene to an illustrated poster bearing her likeness. This is Paris in 1945, and the war has ended. She meets with a man played by Michael Lerner, who works with an office that has re-established communication with the U.S. in search of Lieutenant Colonel Douglas. Michael Lerner doing a French accent yeah. is hard to listen to. Yeah. Is it, is it bad? I wasn't paying attention. It, it, maybe it's just because I'm so used to him. The New Yorker accent that, that he does? Yeah, because I mean, I just I just hear it underneath. As Mayor Ebert. And it's just, it's hard. I like, I, I can't believe him as a Frenchman. Yeah. I, I wasn't even sure if he was playing a Frenchman or if he, he was, was just, just making fun of her. Or or if he was just using French terms for, for Madame and things like that. Oh, maybe. Like, just like, or... yeah, just to be like, you know, I'm in your country. I'll, I should use some of your words at least. Maybe. Back in America, we see Larry reuniting with Kathy after some time apart. She gives him a tour of the place. This is the chair. This is the bedroom. This is the girl. That's the boy. <gasps> Later, we see them planning a post-war life together. Kathy's in a position to hook Larry up with a pilot gig at a major air carrier through her PR agency. 
We cut right to months later, and Noel is being read a list of Larry's failed piloting gigs. It seems like he fails out during the interview process most of the time, but at least once he was terminated for punching his boss. Which, weirdly, we see again later. Yeah. I was like, was this edited out of order, or did he punch more than one boss? I think he punched more than one boss. I think that he's not great at being normal. Right. He's still married, but it's a rocky marriage now, and Kathy started drinking to calm her nerves during the war, but her continued drinking has made their problems worse. We cut to a fancy party where Noel is being introduced to Constantine Damaris. It seems this is actually his third attempt reaching her as a fan of her work. Later that evening, he brags to a rapt audience about his skills in math and that he came from nothing and his siblings stayed nothing. Noel wanders away from the story, and it doesn't go unnoticed. We cut to a bar in America where Fraser pleads with Larry to accept a job as a freight pilot because nowhere else will have him. He tells Larry he owes a stable income to Kathy, and then Larry accuses Fraser of having undue interest in his wife. Let me tell you something, friend. Long before you came along, I decided not to inflict myself on Kathy. Twenty-five years older, I figured she didn't need that. Let me tell you something else. You continue to wait around for World War III, and I'll do every goddamn thing I can to get her to leave you. Before you get her pregnant, like you did that English girl and God knows how many others. Fraser is evidently aware of Larry's M.O. of putting babies in people and then disappearing, and he doesn't want that to happen to Kathy, who he is still very protective of. When Noelle learns that a job seems to be working for Larry, she instructs Michael Lerner's character to get him fired however possible. When he explains it will take more money than an actress of her stature can scrape together, she decides to pursue money. We see a car shuttling up the Greek coast to Damaris's home. On the way, her screenwriter partner predicts that he's about to lose her to the Greek tycoon, and she insists he's being silly. Noelle is led to an incredibly furnished guest room, with two full-time maids awaiting her instructions. When the maids first enter the room, I was like, oh my god, these maids are so tiny. It was like, oh no, that's just a 30-foot door. Yeah. Yeah, this... Look, it's the show Jean. <laughs> what are they doing here? This house is ridiculous. Is this a set? Uh, yeah, most of these are sets, all mm. this stuff in the mansion. She asks the first of the two maids to return a gift of a bejeweled ruby necklace that she's found on a vanity. On a nearby beach, we see a roast pig being cooked and a party underway. When a second gift appears on the same vanity, it has an even bigger sapphire, and again, she turns it down. Over the weekend montage, her writer boyfriend keeps spotting her speaking with others. Uh, it was pretty awesome. They were playing, like, giant yard backgammon. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, because you can't tell the scale at first, and then yeah. the camera backs up, and you're like, oh, shit. Yeah, because when the dice rolls, like, oh, those dice look really fake. It yeah. Because like, <laughs> they were big. Yeah. It, it never, you know, it's like... We've all been to like places where they have like giant Jenga or giant checkers. Chess or boards. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I've never seen a giant backgammon. That's awesome. Yeah. In her room that night, Noelle finds the gift of a simple rose. In keeping with the pattern, she accepts this third invitation and finds Damaris in his room. I, I like how the maid seems so relieved. Yeah. Like, She's like, oh my God, I was going to get hit so hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm so glad that these rich people finally found each other. Yeah. <laughs> She is nearly instantly naked in front of him, and he steps forward to kiss her. We cut back to Michael Lerner's office, and Noel drops a huge briefcase full of cash in front of him to solve the Larry problem, and then we cut to him getting fired. Again, he throws a punch at his boss and knocks the man down before storming out. Now that Larry seems fully unemployable as a pilot in America, she convinces Costa Damaris to buy her a private plane. She has a history of complaining about Greek pilots and is invited to select her own pilot for the plane since it will be hers anyway. Like, how long a game is this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, has, has she purposely been upset about pilots She's been firing for pilots for months. years. <laughs> we cut to Fraser's office as word comes through that Larry has officially gotten the job. He packs up Kathy and they move to Greece to accept it. When, at last, Noel and Larry are reunited, it seems he may find her familiar, but he doesn't immediately recognize her, and I think that pisses her off a lot. His co-pilot warns him that she's a bitch, and he's willing to put up with it for good money. Ah, good morning, Miss Paj. I believe you and your guests are going to Nice. You believe? Shouldn't you know? Larry wants to impress Miss Paj with a smooth takeoff first time, but she manages to complain about it anyway. It doesn't look very smooth either. No, that's no. so wobbly. He's like, we're going to be so good, she's not going to go, oh, shit, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Just taps the ground with the wing. <laughs> That doesn't happen, just to be clear. It kind of does. I mean, it's definitely like a 30-degree angle all of a sudden. It's like, dude, you just said you are going to be smooth. Eventually, Damaris is forced to warn Larry against offending Noel any further. At home, he complains to Kathy about how insanely inoffensive he's been this whole time. 
It suddenly occurs to him that this woman reminds him of an ex-girlfriend. No, it can't be the same girl. That's ridiculous. Why can't you just ask her? Yeah, sure. I, I walk up to the mistress of the richest man in the world and I say, hey, didn't we have an affair eight years ago in Paris? Now, come on, Kathy. When Larry finally confronts her with his suspicion, she doesn't acknowledge it and continues to threaten his employment. It puts him in such a sour mood that he brings home his grumpiness and shouts at Kathy about it. Larry, what did you do with it? Eight years later, she's hey, still just, so I'll angry tell you that a secret. she's... I don't need two women driving me up a wall. After a day of her, I don't need a night of you. Sorry. She suggests going back to America, but Larry can't stand her going back to Fraser again. Sometime later, Noel requests a flight to Zurich, but the weather conditions at the moment are deadly dangerous. It would be futile for Larry to try to talk her out of it, so instead, he goes ahead with the suicide mission. His co-pilot tries to talk her out of the trip, and she holds his job over his head. We cut to the plane on its way, and for the first shot, we see Larry alone in the cockpit. And at first, I thought the other guy just noped the fuck out. Yeah. <laughs> but then he shows up quickly and joins Larry. The weather gets worse and worse as they close in, and Zurich advises diverting to Geneva. The airport is closed to all flights for safety's sake. Larry claims it's an emergency. Then, to prove it was an emergency, they purposely ditch fuel in midair to make it an emergency. <laughs> Yeah, because he said that they'll lose their licenses if they land and they have a full tank of yeah, fuel. Yeah, right. We pull in there with our tanks half full and pull our licenses so fast your mustache will fly off. There's less than 300 feet of visibility and Larry's co-pilot and passenger are both terrified as they plummet through the clouds, but at the last second a runway appears and before the pilots can check on her, Noel pretends to be bored again reading a magazine in the back of the plane. They check into their rooms in Zurich, and Larry's bed is in a room half the size of the room from the Blues Brothers next to the L train. <laughs> he asks which room Noel is in, and then marches right up to it. When she sees him, she tells him to leave, and he grabs her heart and plants a kiss on her face before they collapse into bed together. This seems counterintuitive to what she was trying to do, which was punish him, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I guess was, she just wanted him back, that's all. I was really confused. I guess to have him come groveling back? Yeah, or and to... to, to force him back yeah he's got no other options right. but to take her back i guess they spend several days like this and when larry gets home kathy's been waiting up for him she knows exactly what he's up to and he starts complaining about her drinking all the time back in bed with noel she advises larry to ask kathy for a divorce but she won't agree to it and she won't let him have noel back noel tells him that she won't wait forever she still has the dress he told her to buy and she intends to wear it beside him someday she reminds him that one word to damaris and she could end him we cut to a dinner between Kathy and Larry, and they seem to be planning to leave Greece for good. He takes her on a drive out of town, and they rent a cute little house by the sea. The next day, they buy tickets to explore an underground cave system, but Larry cheaps out on a guide. They sneak around on their own, and Larry keeps pushing past danger keep out signs and exploring deeper and deeper into the cave. What, what are you doing? Larry! Well, it's just to keep kids out. Come on. But uh, Larry, I really think there's a reason that sign's there. No, I think that's they find a dark back corner of the cave with thousand-year-old religious paintings on the walls, and Kathy is blown away to see it. Suddenly, Larry turns off the flashlight, and at first, she thinks he's pranking her, but he ditches her there while she screams for him to come back. She scrambles around in the dark a bit, and eventually tumbles over a cliff, landing hard on the cave floor. We cut to her regaining consciousness in the bed of their rented room under the care of a doctor. When she sees Larry in the room, she recoils in terror and claims that he just tried to kill her, but the doctor insists that Larry called the search party together to locate her in the caves and obviously didn't want her dead. The doctor sedates her. When she awakens hours later, she accidentally overhears a conversation between Larry and Noel plotting to kill her and writes a quick note before escaping out her bedroom window into the pouring rain. I thought for sure this was going to be one of those situations where you hear Noel say, let's just do it now, and she, Kathy just assumes that oh, they're here to murder her, but we were going to cut back and Noel says, ask her for a divorce because she didn't know anything uh, about oh. the cavern attack. Like, it was like, no, no, this is just more straight up murder planning. And it turned out that was just a terrible accident. The batteries died on the flashlight. Yeah. Everybody's innocent. Larry chases Kathy to a nearby dock where she climbs into a dinghy to escape. The terrible storm capsizes the boat and Kathy disappears into the frothing sea. We cut back to the scene from the start of the film as Noel in jail assures Damaris that she is innocent of the murder charges. Damaris asks if she could ever leave Larry and stay with him forever. She lies that she could so that Damaris will ignore everything she's done. He has an attorney in mind, Napoleon Cottus, to defend them from the charges. The man argues that if they're guilty of anything, it's cheating, 
but there's no body and no proof of a death, so they cannot be found guilty of an unproven crime. We learn in the closing arguments that Larry only formed a search party when he was asked on his way out of the cave where his wife had disappeared to, which is very different from saying like, oh, he asked us to help find you. Yeah. It was yeah. just like trying to leave and someone's like, wasn't there a lady of you? Lastly, the prosecuting attorney presents the note that Kathy wrote that night, claiming she overheard her own murder being planned. During a break in the trial, Cottis assures the defendants that at this juncture, their only chance at a lenient sentence is to plead guilty. I See, thought it was interesting because he specifically says uh, in Greek law that you're guilty until proven innocent. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would have immediately called the doctor who treated her and said, would she have been like like in so sound mind to write a note under yeah. all the drugs that you gave her? Yeah. That I told you to give her? Plead guilty? Are you crazy? Please, Mr. Douglas, just listen to me for a moment. Now you listen to me. You listen to me. You want us to plead guilty to a murder that we didn't commit. Now, do you get that? We did not do it. Her death was an accident. That is what you say, but can you prove it? You are not in America now, Mr. Douglas. You are in Greece. And under Greek law, you are guilty until proven innocent. Then prove us innocent. <laughs> just imagine, like police just grabbing people off the street it's like to jail with you <laughs> prove you didn't do anything <laughs> i mean is it actually true or is he just trying to say costa like, let us know how, oh. how often are you arrested <laughs> for no reason that's not what i mean forced that, to defend yourself but i'm just saying like is there not like a, a presumption of innocence a burden of evidence that yeah. needs mm -hmm. to be provided because i would you know in terms of guilt as opposed to proving innocence because it's really hard to prove a negative you can't prove a negative which is most oftentimes it being innocent is proving a negative yeah well I, w I will say that the i don't know if either of you have seen the film denial with rachel vice and uh timothy spall uh -uh. um that whole thing is that rachel vice's character is accusing timothy spall's character of being uh uh a holocaust denier He's suing her for liable and because the burden of proof is on the accuse the person who's making the accusations. The accuser. Yeah. Yeah. Not the accused. So she had, the whole the whole movie is that she has to prove that the Holocaust happened. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> that shouldn't be too difficult, right? And there are That's a lot what of you, you would think. You would, you would think. <laughs> but apparently enough to make a movie out of it. All right. The attorney promises that if they plead guilty, they'll serve a maximum of six months each because a Greek case has never before found people guilty without a body. The court admits that the plea of guilty is very suspicious to them, so the maximum sentence is applied. <laughs> Noel turns shocked to Damaris in the crowd, and he smiles back at her as the judge announces that they will both be sent before a firing squad and shot. Uh, yeah, I would then also, like, well, then this lawyer's coming down with me yeah. because he freaking lied to us. I'd be like, this guy helped us do it. <laughs> <laughs> Checkmate. And Damaris over there thought it was funny. He laughed about it when we told him. Shoot him too. As Noelle prepares for her execution, she does not react at all to the sound of gunfire implying the death of the love of her life, who she plotted to reclaim for nearly a decade now. Is she wearing the wedding dress? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just, so I... she got to stand beside him in it, like she said. She's led to a large rock in a courtyard and offered a blindfold, which she refuses, as a squad line up to fire. She closes her eyes and they shoot her down. We cut to a convent on the coast as Damaris pulls up and parks. We learn that his money has kept this convent operational, and he is led by a nun to a woman they recently rescued from the sea. It's Kathy, dressed in a cloak and fully alive, widowed now by her husband's executioners. Did you remember the last time we had a widow standing by the sea in a cloak? <laughs> <laughs> French Lieutenant Swami? Yeah, I guess I guess she's not technically a widow because yeah, they were she never wasn't married. married yeah. Damaris joins Kathy to kiss her hand and lead her along a path as the credits roll over the scene. I, I thought, again, I kept expecting like crazy twists. Like it's like, oh, this is going to be Noel. Like they somehow faked her, her firing squad oh. and, and got her Because he's away. rich and so he could yeah. get her out of the punishment. That makes sense. Are you guys ready to hear about the sequel to this story I, called I, Memories of Midnight? The sequel after our two main characters have been shot to death? Yes. Yeah, let's go for it. Jane Seymour is Catherine Alexander, and Omar Sharif is Constantine Damaris. Uh. 
The film starts with a recreation of Kathy's apparent death scene at the end of the first film. One important change is that the boat does not capsize on its own in the sequel. Larry manages to tip the boat and dump her into the ocean. So he is guilty in that one. I think so, but the rest of the film implies that he was still executed unfairly well yeah i I like Like, i don't think he was trying to kill her when he tipped the boat but i do really like the fact that they were plotting her murder and then didn't actually do it and still was convicted of it right when damaris finds kathy living at the convent she has lost her memory and he invites her to his home where he intends to coach her to recovery one of the attorneys who advised the defendants to plead guilty can't contain his own guilt having sent innocent people before a firing squad even though we saw one of them dump her in the ocean He confesses to a priest, and that night, he is killed by an assassin. Kathy goes to a fortune teller for... (laughs) Yes. Like the the priest priest, told on him. No, he goes to a priest, and he says, hey, I feel really guilty about this thing I did. I got these people killed. And he tells Damaris also how guilty he feels about it. Oh, okay. I thought the the implication you were saying was that the priest was, like, tattletailing on uh, this guy to Damaris. Yeah, it was like the priest. It it was Cheech Marin from (laughs) Machete, and he killed him after. Oh, I thought it was just going to be Damaris with, like, the little white collar thing. It's like, ha-ha, you fool. You can't see me through this screen (laughs) thing in the confessional. It's it's like the Superman's glasses. You just add the little collar, and you can't tell. It's not the same guy. Kathy goes to a fortune teller for clues to her past, and the woman's like, Hey, I know you. You're Catherine Douglas. You've been here before. (laughs) A second attorney from the same legal team who never had any guilt issues warns Damaris that he has a dead man switch in place to reveal their plot if anything happens to him. The dead man switch is quickly located and disarmed, and the man dies anyway when Damaris burns his house to the ground. (laughs) Wait, wait, what what, what what plot? Whose plot? To get the two innocent people killed. Okay. From the first film. When the priest who heard the confession from the dead man also hears of his assassination, he shares the story of everything with his own nephew. After some coaxing, he's like, well, the guy's dead already. You could tell me what happened if it's bothering you that much. Come on, uncle. He is dead. What difference does it make if you tell me? The nephew takes this information to Damaris' brother-in-law, who hates Damaris for abusing and cheating on his sister. The nephew blackmails Damaris for a ride on his yacht, so Damaris obliges and then blows up his own yacht to kill the guy who knows the secret. (laughs) Man. (laughs) Yep. It's the same thing over and over and over again. Kathy is sent out of town to avoid stumbling across more hints to her past, but tells a new co-worker about the psychic calling her Catherine Douglas, and he puts together that she is the supposedly dead woman, so he tries to call someone, and then he gets killed. (laughs) This pattern continues with Damaris just killing people as they threaten to testify, until Damaris' wife decides that she will kill her husband to end the string of murders. Does the wife even appear in the first home? I didn't know he was married. The only hint that we get is when he says, "You're you're the mistress of the richest man in the world world but that that doesn't even necessarily imply that he's married Mm -mm. but he has a wife and she's very jealous of the fact that he cheats on her all the time in public bizarrely his wife's plan to kill him is to frame him for her murder (laughs) like he did to the couple so she stages a fight and i assume she would fake her death but instead she actually kills herself it just, the, hopes, it just hopes for the best. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> she like destroys their guest house and then stabs herself in the chest and just bleeds out and then climbs into the ocean. And they find her there. And Did she scrawl a note in her own blood that said, uh, no, she sent did a, it? <laughs> she stupidly sent a note to her brother in advance and said, just tell the police that you weren't with my husband this day and you don't know where he was. Uh, okay. And so, so... That will definitely not yeah, cause there's you a to paper end up trail. dead. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so she kills herself. And then it turns out the attorney whose house burns down, he didn't actually die in the fire. He got out. And he agrees to represent Damaris in court in exchange for his entire fortune. So he's like, I will get you off of this murder charge for killing your wife because I want all of your money. You have to give me all of your money if if I do this for you. And he says, okay, we'll do it. And he achieves a not guilty verdict for the man who tried to kill him. And then... And then on the way home from court, he intentionally drives off a cliff to kill the man because he's like, I'm so ugly from the fire. I don't even want your money. Let's both die together. (laughs) Why did you defend the guy in court? What is happening in this movie? That's the end. (laughs) That's the end of the film. They drive off a cliff. Uh, It would have been so poetic for him to be framed for a murder he didn't commit. Yeah. Well, what happens to Kathy? Kathy's out. 
<laughs> no, who knows? She, she literally she it was a two night <laughs> miniseries TV movie, and she's barely in the second half. I don't know, like maybe she was like, I just had an idea for heart shaped necklaces. <laughs> it just wandered away, <laughs> and they were like, you don't have to be in the second half, I guess. <laughs> It'll just be about Omar Sharif. He's available. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. That's special. So anyway, uh, we should talk about the other side of midnight. <laughs> Um, cause I do like, uh, that story and I like the cast a lot, even though they're mostly unknowns, except for Susan Sarandon and Michael Lerner is like the second most famous person. Yeah. yeah. Well, but here's the thing. It's like, I actually really liked this movie. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I didn't actually care for very much was the casting of Susan Sarandon. Not because she's not fine. Because she's too modern seeming? Yeah. She, she's a yeah. little too modern seeming. I can see that. Um, Oh, the other thing that I don't like is 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 who they cast as Larry because I think he needed to be way more charming because he seemed to get away with a lot of shit with these people mm-hmm. and like yeah. I didn't find him appealing at all and I I didn't find him appealing at all like obviously because of his character in this right, movie right, right. but he needed to be so over the top like adorable and like just like oh of course every woman is falling over themselves for this man because he's such a sweet talker but he's just not that so you wouldn't have gone for the the, here is the boy here is the girl the first time even i i just like he's just not that appealing right yeah i i I think that maybe it's just me but like no i i I agree that he seems smarmy from the get-go yeah but he is cute i mean he's a cute guy yeah. And he's in uniform. Yeah. But that's, I just think that this character needs to be somebody who's, like, indisputably, like, so charming. I also feel like there should have been more of a connection to where she came from for her to be so attracted to this guy right off the bat. Like, not just did he need to be more attractive, but there needed to be, like, a deeper reason that she was interested in him yeah. than than his appearance or his general demeanor. Like, I th- I thought that... The, the meet cute with Kathy made a lot more sense where she had kind of embarrassed herself and then ingratiated yes. herself. Yeah. Yeah. But I also feel like this, this is the dude that seems to be able to pull any woman he wants. Why would he pick Susan Sarandon here? Well, because she's Susan Sarandon. She's gorgeous. Yeah. I just, I, I also, I, I don't know. Those two characters, like they, they, the, they were, their acting was fine. I just would have cast them differently. Sure. No, that's fair. He was interesting about his character for me is that how he plays these long games of like, Oh, I, I don't really actually care about this woman, but I'm going to live with her and pay all her expenses. Yeah. Like he, he, they, they made it to the bedroom on like his first date, but he still strung her along for months after that. And then like implied that they were going to get married on his way out the door. Yeah. It's like that wasn't necessary. Yeah. Well then also gave her a six month place to stay. Like, yeah is like oh my goodness like this like I, that's why i was so like i was enamored by his character I was like oh he's such a nice guy like he's gonna get killed <laughs> but then when he doesn't show up yeah yeah i was like oh he, well he fucking died and that's 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 where this movie's gonna go it's like no he's just an asshole who does this with every woman that he meets and i was like how can he afford this yeah what does he do how much does the Royal Air Force, Canadian Air Force pay yeah. that he can afford all this? Well, he must be just, is there some kind of a cash reward system for taking out German planes? There might be. Um, we, when when we go to his quote unquote uncle's place, yeah. I mean, it, it's possible that he comes from money. Yeah, He, he that's says that true. he grew up and lived in Connecticut. So I kind of, and, and, or and, and mentioned like having summers in Montauk and things like that. It's like, oh, so he, he he's probably pretty well to do maybe. Yeah. And he had, didn't he say he had pilot's lessons when he was like 14 or something like that? So he's, yeah, he's been a privileged kid for a long time. But uh, I I should say that I actually really liked this movie as well. Yeah. Um, uh, This is what, this is, this is like kind of going back to um, Heaven's Gate where I was like, oh man, I kind of like this movie. I think Pat and Jesse are going to hate this movie. (laughs) Oh yeah, no, no. I I liked it. I I think the story (laughs) works. I I do think it's longer than it needs to be yeah. by by probably an hour. Um, I think this story could have been told in two 20-minute montages. 
no. <laughs> uh, but I definitely think it could have been shorter. It did not need to be as long as it was. The, the, the length didn't bother me, though, because I think it was it was nicely done in, in, in a similar way, you know, not sweeping landscapes like uh, Heaven's Gate, but... Um, you know, like these these scenes, you you rush through them in your descriptions just because there isn't a lot of things that happen. Yeah. But there, but there's still a lot of like intimate moments and quiet moments. And, sure. You know. But I I feel like we we dwell on things that are maybe not as important, and we do have a few redundant moments. Like I think she meets with Lerner three or four times when it could have been twice the one time when he says you don't have enough money to buy this airline and then the time when she says here's the money buy the airline yeah and she has two run-ins with larry where she confuses him for a non-soldier and it's like those could have been the one scene it didn't need to happen twice in a row on the same day and then you also have a really long scene with the screenwriter who ends up not really playing that important a part but they have sex for like 15 minutes of the movie yeah they have sex for a really long time and then they talk for a really long time after that about how he's going to get her into films and it's like we already covered this with the last guy she was in movies already before this yeah. like like it could have just been literally you guys talk at the restaurant where she met you and then we see you guys having sex for a second and we understand okay she she had sex with the guy and got this job in this movie that she wanted and now he's driving her to damaris's place it, there, there, there are things that could have been shortened. I think without sacrificing the main story, which should have just been between these three characters. Yeah. And I did think it was weird to include that Larry was fucking up like ninety percent of his American workforce options on his own. Like I thought that the point would have been that she's been behind the scenes pulling the strings and getting him yeah, fired everywhere. That's mm-hmm. fair. I think that makes more sense. But the fact that he's just unemployable, then it's like, why does she even need to buy that airline? He was going to punch that boss eventually anyway. Yeah. Because obviously he hated the freight job more than a than a commercial pilot's license. So. Yeah. Uh, I also d- I also thought that the uh, attempted murder in the caves was rather bungled. Yeah. I I feel like that there was much easier ways to. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> definitely. Off your wife. Elaborate. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go deeper into this cave, and then I will. I also get the impression that they planned it that way together. Like there, she was like, "I know where there's a cave system, yeah, where you can lose her." Because it seemed like they knew what they were going to when they went so far off course and found these cave paintings. Like, is this something that he orchestrated with Noel? Like, take her to this Jesus painting and then just leave her there. And I also feel like I would have been able to find my way back a little better than she did. Like. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but uh, just because you turn off a flashlight doesn't mean I'm going to jump off a cliff. <laughs> I feel like I would like touch the ground around me as I crawl right. my way out. Well, because uh, Larry was able to to get out yeah. handily without a flashlight. He didn't have the flashlight on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little strange. Do you remember the last time that we had in a cave full of water underground? The Boogans. Yeah. So I meant to I meant to say that earlier. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I actually I, I enjoyed this movie quite a bit, and I was surprised um, because it kept it kept throwing like these twists at me. Do you remember the last Clue Gulager movie that we had with someone whose name starts with Michael L E A R N E? What? I do not. Touched by Love had Michael Learned in it. Oh. <laughs> I don't think that's how you spell learner, actually. <laughs> I think it's just L-E-R-N-E-R. Yeah, I think so. He's not a perpetual student. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs up, sure. Yeah. But I can see why it may have been a flop. Uh, I think it was only a flop because Star Wars came out like yeah. the same weekend. And right? It was like, let's go see the thing that everyone's talking about because it sounds insane. Yeah. They probably spent too much money on this movie, though. Probably. You didn't need to build any of that stuff. And there's so much international footage that is clearly on location, too. Our director here was Charles Jarrett. We've already covered his next two films, Last Flight of Noah's Ark and Condor Man. The novel was written by Sidney Sheldon. Sheldon's screenplay credits include Easter Parade and Annie Get Your Gun. He was also the creator of The Patty Duke Show, I Dream of Jeannie, and Heart to Heart. Writer Herman Rocher, or Rauscher, wrote Watermelon Man, Summer of 42, and went uncredited for screenwriting work on The Great Santini. Writer Daniel Teradash is an Oscar winner for the screenplay for From Here to Eternity. 
uncredited writing work from Barry Sandler, who has a story credit on Kansas City Bomber, and a screenplay credit on The Mirror Cracked last season. The music is from Michelle Legrand, who wrote the score for The Original Thomas Crown Affair, Ice Station Zebra, Summer of 42, Lady Sings the Blues, F for Fake, and Breezy. So far on the show, we've heard his work in Mountain Men, The Hunter, Atlantic City, and Falling in Love Again. So that's two for Sarandon from him. Cinematographer Fred J. Konekamp. He was the DP on Patton, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, Papillon, The Swarm, The Amityville Horror, and so far on the show, When Time Ran Out, The Hunter, First Family, First Monday in October, and most recently, Carbon Copy. You one of those carbon copy guys? (laughs) Editor Don Camburn also edited Easy Rider, The Last Picture Show, The Hindenburg, The End, Hooper, and Time After Time. We've seen his work on Willie and Phil, Smokey and the Bandit 2, Excalibur, and The Cannonball Run. He's back later this season for Paternity, and later still, he cuts Harry and the Hendersons, Twins, and Ghostbusters 2. Editor Harold F. Cress, there's multiple editors on this, cut The Yearling, How the West Was Won, The Greatest Story Ever Told, The Poseidon Adventure, The Towering Inferno, Gator, and The Swarm. Marie-France Pizier, or Pizier, I don't know how to pronounce French names, played Noelle Page. She worked with Francois Truffaut on short Antoine and Colette, and returned to the character of Colette in the third installment of the series, Love on the Run. She also co-wrote the script for Celine and Julie Go Boating. In 2011, at the age of 66, she died by accidental drowning in her home in France. This was her first English-language film. John Beck played Larry Douglas. Before this, he was Moon Pie in Rollerball and Bill Templeton in Audrey Rose. He was also Mark Grayson on Dallas, and he's the voice of the Punisher on the mid-90s Spider-Man series. Susan Sarandon played Catherine Douglas. She supposedly did all her own stunts in this film, so I guess cave diving and rain running. I was going to say, like, maybe (laughs) being tipped over in that boat. Yeah, she was in the boat. That's true. Boat tipping. That's rain diving, I guess. It's a combination of cave diving and rain running. She was the best part of Loving Couples last year. Before that, she had appeared in Louis Maul's previous film, Pretty Baby, as the mother of Brooke Shields. And on the set of that film, she developed a relationship with director Maul that they maintained through the last film we saw her in, Atlantic City. She's also in Rocky Horror Picture Show, Witches of Eastwick, Thelma and Louise, Dead Man Walking, Stepmom, Speed Racer, Jeff Who Lives at Home. She was Betty Davis on Feud, Betty and Joan. She's the voice of Dr. Wong on Rick and Morty. She's also Lynn Onkman, the Mary Kay Letourneau stand-in on 30 Rock. Raph Vallone played Constantine Damaris. We saw him last as Colonel Diodici in The Lion of the Desert. He's back later as Cardinal Lamberto in Godfather Part 3. Clue Gulliger played Bill Frazier. We saw him last as Don Felder in Touched by Love alongside Michael Lernid. And this time he's working on a film with Michael Lerner. He's a longtime New Beverly regular who passed away in August of this year. He's Abilene in Last Picture Show, Bert in Return of the Living Dead, Mr. Walsh in Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, and Walt Kirby in MacGyver episode Thin Ice. Yeah. That's the that was the father of the or uh yes. It was it wasn't the coach because obviously MacGyver's filling in for the coach. Right, right, I think right. it's the father of the the hockey player who's playing too rough. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but but it was like the father was encouraging him to like to like go after like people, right? right? Yeah, like because they be, thought be, it would get him a place on the, on an NHL team, right? Play dirty hockey, right? Christian Marcond played Armand Gautier. He was Doctor Renaud in Flight of the Phoenix, Jor Grant in I Spit on Your Grave, and Hubert de Marais in Apocalypse Now. Michael Lerner played Barbet. We saw him last year in Baltimore Bullet, Borderline, and Coast to Coast, and earlier this season in The Postman Always Rings Twice. He was Gantner in the MacGyver pilot. Jack Lipnick in Barton Fink, Biederman or Biderman in Blank Check, Mayor Ebert in Godzilla, and dozens of much better films. Sorrel Book played Lanchin. He was Congressman Raskob in Failsafe, Hugo Kalmar in The Iceman Cometh, but he's probably best known for playing Boss Hogg on Dukes of Hazard. Anthony Ponzini played Paul Metaxas. He was Vincent in Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, and Rocco in Hard Bodies. Louis Zorick played Demonides. He was Constable in Fiddler on the Roof, Stuart Adler in The Changeling, Sheik Amir in Up the Academy, and Pete in Muppets Take Manhattan. Charles Chaffee played Kodas. He was Vic Andrazi in Shaft, Peter Cable in Clute, Pop in All the Right Moves, and George Grove in Remo Williams' The Adventure Begins. Lillian Chauvin played Mrs. Page. She was Mrs. Tremont 
in Private Benjamin last year. That's the mother of the evil groom. She was Mother Superior in Silent Night, Deadly Night, Irene Edwards in Predator 2, and Miss Ozzy in Pumpkinhead 2, Blood Wings. Blood Wings? <laughs> I didn't even know that they made a Pumpkinhead 2. Evidently. Lydia Kristen played Housekeeper. She was Helga's mother in Young Frankenstein. She's also credited as Russian woman in The Black Marble, but there's a lot of Russian women in that movie. So it could be the mother of the lead character guy that uh, Robert Foxworth plays. I don't remember. Demetra Arliss played Sister Teresa. She was Loretta in The Sting, Helen in Xanadu, and Natalia in Firefox. Jan Arvin played Warden. This was Jan's final film. He was Dr. Caravello in The Poseidon Adventure. John Chappell played Doc Peterson. He was Captain Cleves in Brubaker and Daddy in Hard Country. I guess that's probably Kim Basinger's dad. I would imagine. Eunice Christopher played Female Guard. She was Eunice again in All Night Long and Mrs. Carbone in Audrey Rose. Howard Hessman played O'Brien. He was Johnny Fever on WKRP in Cincinnati. Pete Lassard in Police Academy 2. And we've seen him so far in Loose Shoes, Private Lessons, and Honky Tonk Freeway. But I usually think of Dr. Faraday in Flight of the Navigator. Yeah. Gary Kelly played Susie. She's only in six movies, and we've now covered four of them. This, Baltimore Bullet, Melvin and Howard, and Hard Country. We just have to get to Rocky 2 and North Dallas 40 somehow. Kurt Lowens played Henri Corrigar. He was Dr. Schuler in Firefox, Stanley Berenger in MacGyver episode Dalton Jack of Spies. Peter Mamakos played Cochianus. He was chief driver in The Ten Commandments. Spoonie Singh in The Man with Bogart's Face, which I think was the owner of the Wax Museum slash Hall of Mirrors. Charles Siebert played Steve. He was Dr. Goodman in Coma and Nevins in All Night Long. George Scaff played Doctor. He was Stuart Martindale in Frogs, Dr. Malvert in Smile. No listed character in Exorcist II, The Heretic, and the much-discussed Nazi, Martin Borman, in Primetime. We've also seen him as a Malta delegate in First Family. Do you remember the last time we saw a Dr. Malvert? Uh, I do remember Malvert. <laughs> yeah. In what? Ah, uh, crap. Student Bodies? Yep. Student Bodies is correct, yeah. and at the end of the film, it turns out that he's actually a professor. He's, he's not the janitor. It was all a dream. So ah. he might be Dr. Malvert at the end. I forget if she calls him Dr. Malvert or not. Just making stuff up. George Spardakos played Spiros. He was Dr. Hankins in Resurrection and an opera critic in Dirty Work, which I think makes him the guy who stands to give a standing <laughs> ovation to the abstract <laughs> Don Giovanni performance when Jack Warden wanders out on stage in a hospital gown and starts hitting on the lead actress. They're releasing skunks into the audience to show the despair. <laughs> <laughs> You're ruining Don Giovanni. You're destroying What's, Who's that dude? <laughs> The play! Oh yeah, we're definitely doing that. <laughs> Ken Carpenter played Air Force Officer. He was Stagehound in Phantom of the Paradise, Doc slash Camerahead in Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth, and Neville in Tammy and the T-Rex. Adolf Hitler played himself in archival footage. Do you guys recall the last time we saw Adolf Hitler in archival footage? He only has one other credit on the show so far. Uh, same time last year? No. <laughs> no. I'm trying to think of other montages. Of no, amazingly, footage. he doesn't show up in the, in that, the footage that, there. That's the they wrong, don't go, it's the wrong year. They don't go far enough back. Yeah. yeah. Um, Try to focus on the Nazi part. I was going to say, there's not any footage of him in Raiders. Nazis. No. Uh, Blues Brothers. No. <laughs> uh, other Nazis. Uh Oh, other Nazis. Biker Nazis? No, no, not biker Nazis. Um, the formula? Not the formula. I'm trying to think of good clues for this one. Sorry. Yeah. Gulliger? That's a good clue. Gulliger? <laughs> clue Gulliger. Gulliger? Oh. How do you say his name? Is Gulliger. it Gulliger? Is it Gulliger? Gulliger? Yeah. Because he's a good clue? No. Yeah. All right. I get it. What, what's the I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What's the movie? Oh. <laughs> you ah, know? You no, know. I know. It's, I'm trying to... Th- I want to give you guys clues to get to it. Um, a film reel plays out in the movie. <laughs> Are seals being be- beaten in it? No, oh, okay. but it, there's, a, there's a screening room somewhere that's playing Nazi footage on a screen. And people are seeing it and they don't want to see it. And it keeps playing no matter what they do. They, they literally oh. have to wrench the projector down because they don't want to see it. Oh, man, I do remember that. What was that movie? Why would a projector play just magically? must be like haunted or something, right? 
Is it Death Ship? Death Ship. Wow. Haunted Nazi artifacts oh my goodness. playing on their oh own. Oh my gosh. That was a tough one. And then the last credit I have here is Harry Holcomb, who plays Man in Restaurant. Remember Man in Restaurant? No. There was like <laughs> 700 people in the restaurant. But he plays the man. So the rest were all ladies. He's Harry Thompson in Empire of the Ants. That's where you guys recognized him from. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I think that's everything for The Other Side of Midnight. Thanks again to Louis Letizia for their generous contribution to the show. If there's any titles you'd like us to review, our top Patreon tier includes a custom review of any pre-1980 title. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, and YouTube, <laughs> but mostly Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing... Oh, oh, I can't tell you yet. But we know, because this is a Patreon pick. These, are, these ones you don't know until they show up in the feed, unless they've been announced. And the, the next one hasn't. So we leave you now with the trailer for The Other Side of Midnight. Here's Here that is. Here there, Here's the boy. There's the girl. How will it end? The other side of midnight. It is a time to dream, to fall in love, to feel the heartbeat of every living moment, of every endless day. It is a very romantic time. In Paris, Noelle, young and vulnerable, daring to live her fantasies at the jagged edges of her broken dreams. In Washington, Kathy, taken by surprise with her own success, dazzled by its glamour, unaware of its price. Larry, loved by both women, the hero in the sky, unable to come down to earth. It is a time for dreams, and heartbreak and hope a time when fantasies can come true the other side of midnight the romance of passion and power. Constantine Demiris, who has the power that extends beyond wealth. The power that knows the price of every woman's heart and every man's soul. The suspense, the intrigue, the emotions that explode when fantasy collides with destiny. Four unforgettable people living the romance, the passion, the excitement on the other side of midnight. 20th Century Fox and Frank Yablons present the other side of midnight. <laughs>